Richard I, King of England, succeeded his father, Henry II, in 1189. He reigned for 10 years. And I think if you ask most people about him, they might know one of two things. First of all, he's famous for being the king who, although he reigned for 10 years, spent only six months of his reign in England. That is, you might even call him an absentee king. And there's a very good reason for that. Just like his father, Henry II, he was a great ruler in France as well as in England. In fact, he ruled more of France directly than the King of France himself. This was a period when there was a kingdom of France, it was recognized, it had its boundaries, there was a king. But the king only controlled in practice the area around his capital, Paris. Most of France was ruled by the great counts and dukes. And it so happened that Richard, just like his father, Henry II, was not only King of England, but also Duke of Normandy, Count of Anjou and Duke of Aquitaine. He ruled an enormous amount of France. So there's a very good reason why he should spend time uh, in France rather than in England, because he ruled so much of it. It does you, leave you to wonder, of course, um, how does a kingdom like England run without a king? In the Victorian period and well into the 20th century, some historians criticise Richard for not paying sufficient attention to England, for being an absentee king in the bad sense of the word. Uh, absentee is often a bad thing. Absentee landlord, absentee parent, and so on. Um, but I think that's a rather inaccurate idea of the actual contemporary situation uh, that Richard found himself in. And we can, we can think about that. But it is worth thinking about, how does a medieval kingdom run without a king? So that's one thing people know, that he's a king who spent only six months of his 10 year reign actually in England. The other thing they know about him, and this is absolutely right, is that he was a great warrior. He was famous as a fighter. Uh, in fact, one of his uh, courtiers put it in a quite dramatic term saying, he rejoiced to travel only on bloodstained roads, which is a fairly dramatic formulation uh, borrowed uh, incidentally from an ancient uh, Roman poet. Uh, and probably the most famous aspect of his, his reputation as a warrior that people know about is as a crusader. Uh, he spent something like four years of his reign away from his own territories uh, on the way to the crusade, fighting the crusade in the Holy Land and on the eventful journey back from the crusade. So this was a reputation that he had at the time. And for Christians at that time to be a successful crusade leader was something that merited the highest honor and the highest desert. It was something that was viewed as a major good aspect of a ruler. And Richard fulfilled that very, very notably. Um, he was actually known as Richard the Lionheart during his own lifetime. Many of these nicknames that we give kings are given to them generations later, sometimes even centuries later, and they have no real contemporary significance. But Richard was known as Richard the Lionheart in his own lifetime. But of course, he wasn't called the Lionheart. He was called Coeur de Lion in French, his own native language. When Richard came to the throne in 1189, uh, Christian Europe was still reeling from an event that had happened two years earlier in 1187. And this was the capture of Jerusalem, which was the capital of the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem, a Christian state, by the great Muslim leader known in the West as Saladin, Salah ad-Din, which I understand means righteousness of the faith in Arabic, which was his honorary title. And Saladin was a great Muslim leader, and he had conquered uh, almost all the kingdom of Jerusalem, destroyed the army uh, of the kings of Jerusalem, and taken the capital. And in order to understand part of the uh, shock that that sent through Christian Europe, we have to go back really quite a long way, 100 years, to the 1090s, not the 1190s, which is when the crusading movement began. Uh, in 1095, the Pope had issued a plea to the nobles of Western Europe to march to the Holy Land 
and to conquer Jerusalem from the Muslims who had had it for centuries at that time. It was the holy city, of course, of, of the Christians, as well as a holy, a holy city to both Jews and Muslims. And the response had been really astonishing. Thousands, probably tens of thousands of people, not only nobles, but the ordinary people as well, had all set out to trek across southeastern Europe, across what is now Turkey, down through Syria, and had finally come to Jerusalem and captured it in the summer of 1099. And that was a famous event known to all Christians in, in the West. And the establishment of the Crusader Kingdom, ruled by Christians with uh, uh, Jerusalem at its heart, had been reckoned to be one of the great achievements of the militant Christianity, which was uh, def uh, definitely dominant at that time. So when, almost 100 years later, the Muslims under Saladin recovered it, conquered Jerusalem, conquered most of the Crusader Kingdom, that was uh, a shocking event. And the response in the West was to launch another crusade. We call it, in retrospect, the Third Crusade. And Richard was going to be one of the leaders of that. As soon as he became to, came to the throne, he, he began making arrangements to set out to the Holy Land. That was the first thing he wanted to do. In the Holy Land, the local Christians had already begun a kind of counterattack, trying to re-establish their control in the face of um, Saladin's offensive. And what they chosen to do was to lay siege to a city called Acre. And Acre was on the coast, unlike Jerusalem, and it was an important trading center and more important as a town, far more important as a town than Jerusalem, although Jerusalem had the religious symbolism. Uh, and it had been conquered like most of the rest of, of the kingdom by the Muslims and they had occupied Acre. The Christians got a force together and began to besiege Acre. They surrounded it on the landward side and they tried to blockade it on the seaside. And Saladin, of course, had to take countermeasures. He came up to Acre and he didn't have sufficient forces to completely surround the besiegers, but it was a little bit like the besiegers were now being besieged. So there was a large Muslim garrison defending Acre. There was a Christian army outside besieging it and there were Saladin's forces beyond that. And that's the situation which was going on now. It went, went on for a long time. The siege of Acre went on for two years and it was something that was reported on back in the West. And Richard and other leaders of the crusade knew that was going on. That was going to be their first goal. Their first goal was to get to Acre. Richard had to also take into account the King of France at the time. Throughout his reign, the King of France was Philip II, known also by a contemporary nickname, Philip Augustus. And Richard and Philip Augustus had a very tense, fraught relationship, as you can imagine, because the King of France recognizes him as a major threat to the king's own power in France, which it was. But they come to an agreement because they recognize that the crusade is a common goal and Richard and Philip agree to go off, to set off on crusade together, which they do. They don't stay together, but they set off together. And Richard is quite happy with that because of course he doesn't want to go to the Holy Land and leave Philip Augustus to prey on his home territories. Uh, they make their way slowly. They go down to the south of Italy in that time, winter navigation in the Mediterranean was very unusual. They actually stay for most of the winter in southern Italy and then finally set off. Uh, on the way, Richard, very characteristically for Richard, he's a, he's a famous warrior, conquers Cyprus. He just does it on the way. The king of Cyprus, the ruler of Cyprus rather, is a, is a breakaway Byzantine prince. Uh, and he makes the mistake of mistreating some of uh, Richard's relatives who who uh, dock in Cyprus on the way to the Holy Land and Richard seizes the opportunity to conquer Cyprus and eventually Cyprus is given to a, a French nobleman as a, as a kingdom and the kingdom of Cyprus is then very very important in maintaining the crusading states uh, throughout the rest of the Middle Ages. It's, it's a Christian state down to the end of the Middle Ages so it's an important development. Uh, Richard and Philip finally get to Acre and this is where his arrival, the arrival of his forces, the forces he brings and the other leaders bring, and his leadership transform the situation so that this siege that has been going on for two years ends quite soon after Richard gets there. The, the Muslims inside Acre surrender on terms and the Christians can reoccupy that very important city. And in fact, it was to be uh, the last place in the Holy Land to be held by Christians. It's not, it's not finally taken by the Muslims uh, for another hundred years. So 
it's, an, it's a very important political uh, and military development. Very soon after the fall of Acre, the surrender of Acre, Philip Augustus goes home. And he was criticized for this, not only by his enemies, but also by many of his own men who thought that he hadn't really done the job yet. The capture of Acre was only the start. Uh, and many of his men actually stayed on with Richard because Richard had quite a lot of money. He could, he could pay them well. Uh, and they also had a leader who would help hope that hopefully lead them to, to conquer Jerusalem, which was the ultimate goal. Um, so Richard stays on and, and from then on, he's the basically, he's the, he's the leader of the Crusaders in the Holy Land. And he has a, a, a strategic aim, which is once he's taken Acre, which is in the, in the north of the kingdom, he intends to march down the coast, the Mediterranean coast, uh, of what's what, what is now um, uh, Israel and Gaza, and to capture those maritime cities. And therefore, the Crusaders would have a bridgehead. They'd have a place there which could be uh, supplied and, and remanned by sea from Europe. And then they could move inland to conquer Jerusalem. That was the plan. One of the things that was delayed him was the existence of 3,000 Muslim prisoners uh, who had surrendered in Acre and a event that was quite controversial at the time was what happened to those prisoners. Um, Saladin had offered to pay an enormous ransom uh, and also free many of the Christian prisoners he had in return for the lives of those 3000 Muslim soldiers. And Richard had agreed, they'd come to terms and they'd also agreed dates when this ransom was gonna be paid. Something went wrong. There was a there were crosswires. There were there were differences. The deadline for the full payment came and went, and Richard hadn't received the full payment, and he began to wonder whether Saladin was just stringing him along. He didn't feel he could march away from Acre, leaving even prisoners, three thousand Muslim prisoners there. He couldn't afford to have enough leave enough men to guard them. Uh, he ordered those three thousand Muslims to be killed in cold blood. So the massacre of the garrison of Acre is one of the things that is often discussed about Richard and his, uh, his brutality, but it also has to be seen, of course, in, in light of the customs of the time. The massacre of a, of a garrison that had not surrendered was absolutely standard. There was nothing surprising about that. Really, the question was the terms. There were actually even Muslims who blamed Saladin for not being quick enough off the mark to pay the full ransom. So it was, it was a slightly complicated position. And Richard then begins his march south and manages to establish his foothold right along the Mediterranean coast of the Holy Land. Uh, occasionally, he actually comes into full-scale battle with Saladin's uh, armies, no, uh, normally wins, always wins, um, but he doesn't manage to get to Jerusalem. Strangely enough, even the, after the massacre at Acre, relations between Richard and Saladin seem always to have been courteous, uh, even friendly. When Richard was ill, uh, Saladin sent him fruit and snow and ice from the mountains. So you have a very strange picture whereby Richard has been squabbling really with most of the other crusade leaders. There was a lot of bad blood between them, but he actually gets on reasonably well with Saladin himself. Saladin, they never meet. But Saladin's brother does a lot of the negotiation and, the, and they do exchange um, courteous embassies. In the end, Rich, after a long period, Richard decides that he's, he's not going to get Jerusalem. He hasn't got the resources. It's not going to happen. So very sadly, <clears throat> but having established, re-established the Crusader Kingdom, at least along the seaboard, he decides to return to, the, to Western Europe and to his own territories. And this is where things began to go wrong. Uh, he was sailing in the winter season, which was, as, as I've mentioned, unusual in the Mediterranean in that period. Uh, his fleet gets dispersed. Uh, he's uh, trying to decide where to make land in Western Europe. And one of the problems is that many of the places where he might land are ruled by his enemies. Say he, ruled, say he went to the south of France. The south of France, he might fall into the hands of the Count of Toulouse, who was an ancient enemy of the Dukes of Aquitaine including Richard, Duke of Aquitaine. In Italy, he had many enemies. There are, there are some conflicting stories about what happened next. There's, he seems at one point to have been shipwrecked. At any rate, we do know that eventually he landed 
right at the head of the Adriatic, not far from Venice, with quite a small group of followers. And he decided he would make his way overland through Germany and perhaps partly into Eastern Europe uh, with these followers. And he would go in disguise, incognito, so that if he in fact came to the lands of his enemies, he would stand a chance of getting through. So this journey began, this journey northwards from, from the Adriatic. And in the depths of winter, it was December, and Richard manages some of the way to get along. There are all sorts of stories told about this time, about how this group of, of apparent poor pilgrims seemed to be full of rings and jewels and stuff and spending money like nobody's business. This was not very good disguise. Uh, eventually, which was a really bad luck for Richard, his route takes him through Vienna. And Vienna is part of the Duchy of Austria. And the Duke of Austria was one of the people who hated Richard the most for the way that they behaved when they were in the Holy Land. When Acre fell, the Crusaders went into the city. And what they did was the leaders raised their standards, their banners, their flags. And that indicated who had conquered the city and who would get the loot. And Richard had his banner raised and Philip Augustus had his banner raised. And then the Duke of Austria, who at this time was the head of the German contingent, had his banner raised. But Richard didn't think he actually had a claim to the city and its loot. So he ordered Leopold, that's the, the Duke, the Duke's banners to be taken up and thrown down. This was a deep insult, a very deep insult, and Leopold felt it. So when he hears that his uh, enemy, who's insulted him so much in the Holy Land, is now in Vienna and with a few groups, a few men, he's very, very happy. Richard is captured by the Duke of Austria. It's not Crusaders are meant to be protected. That's part of the law of the church. But the Duke of Austria had enmity that was much greater than paying attention to the law of the church mattered to him. So Richard is now a prisoner. He's put into an Austrian castle, so he can't get away. And people still don't know where he is. Lots of people don't know where he is. Some people think he drowned on the way back. It's, it's a mystery for a while. The situation is complicated a little bit by the fact that the Duke of Austria is uh, a, a member of the Holy Roman Empire. Austria is part of the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire is this rather unusual state. It consists basically at this time of Germany and Northern Italy and its ruler, as its name suggests, is an emperor rather than the king. Uh, the emperor at this time is uh, called Henry VI. This is also very bad news for Richard. Henry VI was a member of a family, a dynasty, called the Hohenstaufen in English, uh, the Stauffer in, in German. Uh, and this Hohenstaufen dynasty had a, a feud, a rivalry, which went on for generations with another great noble German family called the Welfs. They, incidentally, they, the, the Welfs are the direct ancestors of the present day royal family in the United Kingdom. And Richard's family were deeply allied with the Welfs. His sister had married the head of the Welf family and their son, Otto of Brunswick, who was the subsequent head of the Welf family, was one of Richard's favourite nephews. So Henry VI is finding this ally of his enemies now being held as a prisoner by one of his own dukes. And he decides to buy Richard off the Duke of Austria a very high price. Richard is very valuable. So the ransom uh, negotiations are going to a very high level. And in the end, the Duke of Austria sells Richard, that's the really the sensible, most sensible way to describe it, to Henry VI. And Henry VI transfers him from an Austrian castle to his own castle of Trifels, which is a huge Hohenstaufen stronghold. It's where they kept the imperial treasure. So it's a real, it's a real stronghold. And that's where Richard ends up. And Henry VI knows the politics of the time. He writes a letter to Philip Augustus of France. He says, oh, I've got some great news that will make you very happy. Uh, King Richard is a prisoner of mine. So he knows exactly how Philip Augustus will feel about this. And he's right. But of course, that means now the news is out. So now it's public. We know where Richard is. People know where Richard is. He's a prisoner of the Holy Roman Empire in his stronghold at Trifels. And from then on, two things happen. First of all, once the English officials and bishops and the people who run England and also uh, Richard's uh, officials in his lands in France know where he is, they come and visit him. 
and he's held not in such tight confinement that he can't have these visitors and discuss things with him. So now Richard can have a bit of feedback about what's going on in his home territories, and he can also make decisions. So that is beginning to happen. The other thing, of course, is that Philip Augustus knows that his most bitter enemy is locked up and cannot defend his own lands, whereupon he immediately invades Richard's French dominions, Normandy, Anjou, and so on, and begins to make enormous territorial gains, conquering castles and land. And in doing so, he has an ally, and that ally is Richard's younger brother, John. John was always willing to change sides if necessary, to betray people if necessary, and he immediately joins Philip Augustus. He does homage to Philip Augustus for the French lands, and he cedes territory to him. So Philip Augustus and John together, that is Richard's main enemy and his younger brother, are now proceeding to begin a little bit of dismantling of Richard's power. Richard hears of all this in his prison, and he's, he's not too bothered about John. He says, uh, my brother John is not the kind of man to take territory by force if there is anyone to resist him. He didn't really have a very high opinion of his, of his, younger, of his younger brother. Eventually, a huge ransom is negotiated for Richard's release. The ransom amount came to uh, more than the annual income of England, the annual royal income of England, perhaps twice as much, something like that. So it's an enormous amount. That's agreed. And Richard leaves hostages with the Holy Roman Emperor to guarantee the payment of that ransom and is released. And immediately, of course, uh, the situation is completely changed by his release. He's now able to return and begin the process of repairing the damage that's been done in his captivity. He'd been in captivity for more than a year, and he now has to return and begin to sort out exactly what he's going to do next, what his politics are going to be, and how things are going to be run now that he's returned. So the question arises, if you've got a king who rules for 10 years, but is only in the kingdom for six months, how does that kingdom run? What happens? Well, first of all, it's probably worth stressing that Richard's behavior was not particularly different or more innovative than that of his predecessors. Ever since 1066, uh, kings had to be absent from England for long periods of time. In 1066, the Duke of Normandy had conquered England. And of course, he had no desire to give up Normandy just because he'd conquered England. So for most of the succeeding period, uh, the ruler of England was also the ruler of Normandy. Uh, that was intensified when Henry II came to the throne because he was not only Duke of Normandy, but he was also Count of Anjou and Duke of Aquitaine. So the idea of a large body of territory that crosses the channel, to, you know, the channel makes no difference to them in a way. Uh, it's a bond between the two bits rather than a barrier. This is the so-called Angevin Empire, which uh, some people dislike the term, some people use it, I don't know. Uh, they, the kings were used to going backwards and forwards across the channel all the time. This was, this was just part of the, of, the, of the role of a Norman or Angevin king. Uh, they even had a special boat or ship that they kept for this. Uh, normally, um, when uh, the king wanted ships, he would either hire them or impound them from his merchants. He didn't keep a permanent navy. But the big ship that was used for going backwards and forwards across the channel was permanently kept uh, ready with a staff, a captain and a crew who were, who were paid throughout the year. This was unusual. The ship was called a snecker, which is the Old Norse word for snake, because, of course, it uh, had a carved serpent's head at the front and so on. So it looked a bit like a snake. And the Normans had originally been Vikings. That's where they, they'd come from. And their shipbuilding te uh, techniques were still very similar to those of the old Viking ships. So going backwards and forwards on the Snecker was one way of doing this, right? So that's one way kings could keep the two parts of their realm together, just by going backwards and forwards, which they did all the time. The other thing that's worth stressing, really, is that England, the Kingdom of England, was for medieval conditions, given medieval conditions, a relatively centralized, uniform kingdom. 
it had an administrative structure uh, that was uh, the same throughout uh, the counties. The whole of England was divided into counties. Most of those counties are, were the same uh, for the next, um, well, right up until the county reorganization of 1974. In fact, they, they, they became permanent fixtures of the English landscape. Uh, they were headed by sheriffs who were royal officials who, had, who held courts. Uh, the coinage throughout England was uniform and it was royal coinage issued in the king's name. Uh, he could change the coinage every so often, which he did. And then the whole coinage throughout the kingdom changed and you had new coinage. None of this was true of your average medieval kingdom, which were much more decentralized than that. So you already had uh, a structure. And this went right back to the Anglo-Saxon period. This wasn't a creation of the Normans or the Angevins, but it had been in some ways intensified by the Angevins by Henry II's uh, legal reforms, because by putting a stress on royal justice and having royal justices travel throughout the kingdom and apply uniform law, the so-called common law, that uniform, well-governed, or at least intensively governed feature of England had been made more intense. So you've got the kings going backwards and forwards. You've got uh, a relatively uniform administrative system. And then I think the last thing that enables England to survive without a king is that the kings had put a lot of trust in a class of royal servants who could administer things with only a modicum of day-to-day -day royal interference. And the example uh, that jumps out at you from Richard's reign uh, is a man called Hubert Walter. And Hubert Walter was from what you might call a middling knightly family. He didn't come from the great aristocracy. It would be dangerous, I think, to put power into the hands of the great nobles because they might decide they wanted complete autonomy. They wanted to run things for themselves. Nor was he from the peasantry or the urban classes, the, the burgesses. He didn't create resentment on the part of the aristocracy by being, as it were, as they would see it, low born. So you had this class the middling knightly class who could supply royal servants. Hubert Walter is a perfect example. In fact, that class later on called the gentry uh, are actually responsible for running England at the local level and sometimes later at the national level uh, for hundreds of years after this, after this period. So Hubert Walter gets his uh, experience in government at first of all as a judge, He's, a, he's, a, he's one of the active royal justices in the period uh, after Henry II. In diplomacy, he's sent on missions to neighboring kingdoms, and he's also active in provisioning troops, providing the provisions for royal troops, which of course, for someone like Richard the Lionheart would be a very attractive uh, characteristic. So he values Hubert Walter. When, when Richard becomes king in 1189, the first thing he does is make Hubert Walter Bishop of Salisbury. This was a time when church and monarchy mostly worked in cooperation, hand in hand. There are spectacular spats, a well-known one from the time of, um, of, of Richard's father, Henry II, is of course the Becket dispute, which ends with the archbishop being killed in his own cathedral. But those were really the exceptions. Most of the time, the bishops are pretty much appointed by the king and very often in royal service. A royal official might affect a successful royal uh, official might expect a bishopric to be his prize. And of course, the bishops were not just uh, people who prayed. They weren't just priests. Uh, bishops had castles. They had knights. They had huge estates and income. So they are they're the equivalent, as it were, of, of ecclesiastical barons. So Richard giving, I think giving is the right word, uh, the bishopric of Salisbury really, to Hubert Walter makes perfect sense. And he trusts Hubert Walter so much that he actually sends him on to Acre uh, as head of a, an advance guard when the crusade takes place. During the winter, when Richard and Philip Augustus are, are wintering in southern Italy, Hubert Walter is already in Acre and he undertakes military activity there and, and negotiations. He negotiates with Saladin. In fact, and, and there are these supposed reports anyway, of conversations between Hubert Walter and Saladin, whether they're made up or not, I don't know, but they reflect on the fact that he was responsible for many of the negotiations. 
So Richard trusts him. He's a very important man. One of the first people to visit Richard in uh, Trifels, in the uh, stronghold where he's being held prisoner by the Holy Roman Emperor, is Hubert Walter. And in fact, it's from his prison uh, that Hubert Walter uh, is appointed both Chief Justicia, that's the head of the legal and administrative structure of the kingdom, and at the same time, Archbishop of Canterbury, head of the English church. So Richard, Richard is in prison, but he appoints him to both those positions. And that means really that Hubert Walter is now running England on Richard's behalf. The first thing he has to do, of course, is to rustle up the money for the ransom. And this was a major activity uh, of Hubert Walter's at this time. He um, actually creates the, the, a separate exchequer to deal with the ransom. The exchequer is the accounting office, the central accounting office for royal income. And it had been going for generations at this time. But the, the demands of the ransom are so huge that they actually create temporarily uh, an exchequer for the ransom. So Hubert Walter is busy raising money. He's also clearly a natural bureaucrat. He believes in record keeping and regularity and being able to look things up and documentation. So the period in the 1190s, late 1190s, when Hubert Walter is, is basically running the country on Richard's behalf, is a period of enormous change in the available documentation. This is, this is obviously very important for historians, but it's also a fact about the government at the time. Um, plea rolls begin from that period. You actually have records of English court hearings, the actual details of the court hearings. Um, there's a, a systematic national scheme for enrolling and recording land transactions. Uh, Hubert Walter creates the office of coroner, for example. So, and he carries on doing that actually after Richard's reign, because he continues active in government after Richard's reign. So there's this enormous transformation in the world of, rec of, of record keeping. So that's one of the things that Hubert Walter is responsible for. So you've got in Hubert Walter a perfect example of the kind of people who could keep England running with minimal involvement from the king, even if the king was absent, as he was from 1194 to 1199, the last half of Richard's reign, he was uh, always in France, he was never in England, and Hubert Walter was basically running the country. And what Richard wanted from Hubert Walter primarily was to raise taxes from England, what for? Firstly, to pay the ransom, and secondly, to engage in the endless warfare that marked the second half of Richard's reign. One of the things that any medieval king had to think about all the time was the succession. Who was going to succeed them when they died? And this would depend, of course, on their family situation, who was available. Um, that's why marriage negotiations are so important, so on and so forth. Uh, when Richard came to the throne in 1189, um, the family situation was as follows. He was not married and he had no legitimate children. He seems to have had one illegitimate son, but he never came into consideration for succession. So Richard doesn't have an obvious heir in the form of a, of a son. Uh, he, Richard was one of four brothers, the children of Henry II and Eleanor of Aquitaine. His older brother, Henry, uh, had actually been recognized as heir in the most uh, definite way possible. His older brother had actually been crowned king during the reign of his father's lifetime, during the reign of Henry II. This is entirely unusual in England. Uh, but this Henry had died before his father. So the Henry, the older brother of, of Richard, is out of the picture. Richard has two younger brothers. The next brother after Richard was Geoffrey, Count of Brittany. Geoffrey, Count of Brittany, had also died before his father, but not before he had uh, fathered a, a son. The son was actually born after his death, a posthumous son. Uh, and this was a, a, young, a young baby who was christened Arthur. So this is the son of Geoffrey of Brittany, that is Richard's nephew. And Arthur was a name that for the Bretons, just as for the Welsh, symbolized uh, an ancient Celtic hero who would one day 
return to a heroic present. So it was a very programmatic name. Uh, it is said, although it's not quite clear whether it's true, that Henry II, that is Arthur's grandfather, was very, very cross when he heard that his grandson had been called Arthur because it suggested this Celtic revival. In any case, so there's this young, this young child, Arthur of Brittany. And then there's the fourth brother, Richard's youngest brother, John. And as we've already seen, John was willing to seize his chance to put, betray his brother, just as in the last years of Henry II, John had betrayed his father. He was, he was willing to do that. The question arises, of course, who has the better claim? Is it Arthur, who is the son of the third brother, or John, who is the fourth and youngest brother? You might say, well, Arthur kind of represents and inherits the claims of his father, and the third brother is more closer in line than a, than a fourth brother. Or you could say that, well, John is a brother of Richard, and he's closer than a mere nephew. And nowadays, of course, in, in a royal family like that of the present day United Kingdom, you just look up a table and it says first in line, second in line, fourth in line, 17th in line, 28th in line, etc. It's all written down. But in the late 12th century, that wasn't the case. There wasn't a clear rule of precedent. And the claims of different family members could be raised with an element of plausibility. So this actually was a, a, a there's a legal side to the question, who, who has the better claim? Uh, that had an effect, actually, on English law for a generation or two after this. The decision had to be made between claims of an uncle and claims of a nephew, uh, if the nephew was the son of, a, of an old brother. So that's not quite clear. What is much more difficult to explain about the succession situation is that Richard married very late. When he, when he came to the throne... Uh, he had been engaged to the daughter of Louis VII of France for 20 years, 20 years. So that is Philip Augustus's sister. And Philip Augustus was quite, quite keen that Richard should indeed marry his sister, as had been promised. Uh, but that took a very long time, so 20, more than 20 years, this engagement. And one of the things that really turned the relations between Richard and Philip Augustus even sourer than it was already was what happened when they're in southern Italy on their way to the Holy Land. And Philip is saying, <clears throat> Philip is saying, when are you going to marry my sister? And Richard says, I can't marry your sister because when she was in the custody of my father, Henry II, she'd been gone into the custody of, of the of Richard's father when she was a young girl. Uh, he says, my father seduced her and she actually had a child uh, and I can't possibly marry someone who my father has slept with. Now that's recorded by a very reliable chronicler and it seems a rather unusual thing for anyone to make up. So I think we can believe that Richard believed that. And it's also not impossible that it was true. But of course, it's an enormous insult to the honor of Philip and his sister. And that's the kind of thing that made the feelings between Philip and Richard that much more personal. Sharpened, I think, by the fact that while they were both there in Southern Italy, uh, Richard's new fiance turned up uh, in order to marry him en route to the Holy Land. And this was a woman called Berengaria of Navarre. And Navarre is a, a, a kingdom on the Pyrenees that neighbors Aquitaine. So from the point of view of uh, marriage politics, which is how medieval royal marriages uh, have to be viewed, uh, marriage politics, it was, a, it was a reasonable and sensible thing for Richard to do because he now created an alliance with the Royal House of Navarre neighboring Aquitaine, one of his most important territories. And in fact, uh, the King of Navarre did subsequently help Richard in, in the conflicts in that region. So it was, a, it was a rational political marriage. But of course, it can't have made Philip Augustus feel any happier. 
Uh, Richard and, and, his, and Berengaria actually got married in Cyprus on the way to the Holy Land, I think the only King of England to have got married in Cyprus. What happens then is that there's clearly people saying to Richard later, you should pay more attention to Berengaria. You should sleep with Berengaria more, right? This is, this is said by bishops and spiritual advisors. So he's married very, very late and he doesn't seem to show very much interest in his wife. And he certainly doesn't have any children by her. This has led some people, modern historians, I mean, to theorize that he was in fact homosexual. Now, there's no other evidence for that, uh, but it has been argued and it even gets into uh, popular uh, culture because in the 1968 film, The Lion in Winter, uh, in which uh, Anthony Hopkins has his first major role as Richard the Lionheart, the suggestion of homosexual attraction between him and the French king, Philip Augustus, uh, is actually made very clear. It's part of the plot. But there doesn't really seem to be much evidence for that otherwise. It's been debated. What is the fact, and there's no question about it, is that Richard didn't have a son. So that he is now, he's, you know, in his late 30s, and he has Arthur, who's slowly growing up, and John, who is, as we know, can't be trusted. This is a situation in the last years of his reign, which we know, we know to be the last years. Nobody then knew it was the last years, right? Nobody then knew it was the last years. But in this period, um, from his release from captivity through to 1199, the main activity that Richard engages in is endless warfare with Philip Augustus in order to recover the lands that he lost when he was imprisoned and Philip took them over and John surrendered them. So there's this endless warfare. And because Richard is a great warrior, he normally gets the better of it, but it's ongoing. It goes on year by year. And it goes on in many theaters because there are various parts of his territories that are being threatened. Aquitaine, at the, the nobility of Aquitaine is always restless and rebellious, always willing to uh, hear uh, overtures from Philip Augustus. Anjou itself, the old heartland of the Angevins, uh, uh, it has been threatened. Normandy, uh, Rouen, the capital of Normandy, is just a, a couple of days ride downstream, down the Seine from Paris, the capital of the King of France. And the King of France and the Duke of Normandy have a common frontier on that, in that territory there. And in fact, Philip Augustus had made real gains on, on that borderland during Richard's captivity. So this is all going on and Richard flings himself into it with all his energy and all his warlike uh, gusto, I think is the word. I think he really loved fighting. One of the things he does is that between Rouen and Paris on the River Seine, he builds an enormous castle, Chateau Gaillard it's called. And uh, it's even the ruins of it, which survive to this day are very dramatic. It's a very dramatic site. Uh, and that costs more than any other castle built uh, by, by Richard. And it was meant to be uh, a stronghold barring the way to Rouen. The French king couldn't march down the Seine straight to Rouen and not get bump into Chateau Gaillard and its defenses. So there's this warfare going on all over France. Truces every so often, none of them last very long. In 1199, there is a rebellious activity in Aquitaine, as there almost always is. Uh, Richard goes down there to deal with it firsthand, as he always does. He's a hands-on fighter. He's not a general standing back and telling soldiers what to do. He's, he's up there in the, in the front line. Uh, and he's besieging this castle of a rebellious vassal. Uh, and he goes to do a reconnoiter. And he goes out, not with his full armor on, just to have a look and see the situation. On the battlements of that castle, there is a crossbowman. And crossbowmen were particularly lethal when they were in a fixed and defensible site. The crossbow has a rather slow uh, rate of fire in comparison with the longbow. The longbow is much far, many, many more arrows per minute than a crossbow. But on the other hand, the crossbow bolt has enormous penetrating power. And also a crossbow can be, uh, aimed pretty accurately. So this crossbowman on the battlements sees the chance, hears the 
leader of the besieging forces out there on, you know, within range, without full armor, and the crossbowman shoots and hits Richard in the shoulder. So the crossbow bolt goes into his shoulder. And within a short time, that wound, which is not itself going to kill him, uh, goes gangrenous. And Richard knows he's going to die. And in a couple of days, he does indeed die. And the whole political world is suddenly turned upside down. The whole politics of Northwestern Europe is suddenly turned upside down by something that one didn't know was going to happen. That was sudden. And it was done. The, the incident entirely reflects Richard's reputation. It supposedly said that Saladin, when talking to Hubert Walter in one of these conversations they were meant to have in the Holy Land, said, your king is a great leader. He's a brave man, but he shouldn't always be at the front. That's very rash of him. He's very rash. And that rashness was, of course, one of the things that led to his vulnerability that day when he received the, the lethal wound from the crossbow bolt. So the world is suddenly changed. We have two candidates for the succession, Arthur and John. That's obviously going to be the next issue in the politics of this world. And things are going to change quite dramatically. Within five years of Richard's death, Philip Augustus had conquered Rouen, capital of Normandy, and the Angevin Empire was beginning to disintegrate completely. But that, of course, uh, is another story. Hello guys, thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoy our work and would like to support the channel, please visit our revamped Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee membership pages, which contain rewards, such as early access to our content, merchandise discounts, and audio versions of our videos, along with much more that we give to our valued supporters. If you have not yet signed up to help our cause, we'd like to ask you to please consider doing so, as we need to secure the channel by safeguarding it from possible demonetization, and also invest in better equipment, software, and more people to help us improve our videos going forward. In short, without your contributions, these videos would not be possible. So if you would like to ensure this channel never has to shut down due to demonetization, please spare whatever you can per month and become People Profiles patrons. Thanks for listening.